you have your Bibles, you can take them now, please, and turn to one king, or sorry, two kings, chapter five. Two kings, chapter five. I need to turn there too, because I was in one kings, chapter five. Two kings, chapter five. This morning, we apologize, especially to all at home. We're having some technical difficulties. We got a new laptop this week. God bless DBC with a new laptop. However, it doesn't seem, when the moment of truth came, it seems to have let us down. So we have some work to do on that yet. But anyways, I have a backup. There will be an audio recording for anyone at home that might miss out this morning. So it could be that you're the privileged few who get to listen in um, and be part of the service this morning. But thank you all for registering, for coming along to the service, and just to encourage you to continue to register week by week. 2 Kings chapter 5. And um, this morning I just wanted to mention that I was, to be honest, the message I'm giving this morning, I normally start with my own work in the passage of Scripture, but actually I was inspired um, to give this message as I listened to a message by Dale Ralph Davis on 2 Kings 5. And so this message is very influenced by first listening to him, and I need to give him credit for that. Um, uh, and the inspiration I received from Dale Ralph Davis. The story is told of a little girl. For years, she wanted to go to Disney World in Florida. That was her dream. Her father, her father promised that one day he would bring her. So the father booked the trip for her. He made all the arrangements, all the payments, but the parents decided that they would keep the timing of the trip a surprise for their little daughter. The month before their trip came, and the little girl had a particularly bad month. She was living in a particularly self-centered way. She was a little terror for the month. She was caught stealing from her parents. She was caught lying to her parents. She insulted her parents in her anger. She was behaving like a mutinous little pirate for the month in the run-up and in the days running up to the surprise trip to Disney World. Would the trip go ahead? Her parents had to appeal to her right up until the day before they were to go. They were thinking, should we cancel this trip? But they went ahead and the father took them to Disney World anyway. And toward the end of the first day, the little girl was having an absolutely brilliant day, and as she waited in one of the queues to get on to the next ride, she turned to her dad and said, Daddy, it was not because I've been good that you brought me to Disney World. You brought me here because you love me and because I'm yours. She knew she had done what was wrong, she had not earned the right to go to Disney World, but she was given grace. And we want to talk about grace this morning. There was once a conference of comparative religion, and the author C.S. Lewis was invited to go to that conference, and he was a little late um, because of delays in his travel, and he turned up, and there was this great debate going on, and he turned up and said, what's all the debate about? And they said, well, listen, we're trying to figure out what makes Christianity unique in comparison to all the other faiths of the world. And, Christ and C.S. Lewis said, well, what's all the debate? He said, that's an easy answer. The answer is grace. Grace is what makes Christianity completely unique to all other faith systems in the world. But what is grace? What is grace? By grace you have been saved. Well, I'd like to bring us a bit of a definition that I put together through various things I've studied and read. And this is the definition I'd like to put to us. Grace is God's undeserved, unearned gift of favor and forgiveness that is freely given through Jesus to those who deserve wrath. Undeserved, unearned, a free gift for those who deserve judgment and wrath. Grace. One thing that might help us to understand grace is what is the opposite of grace? What's at the other end of the spectrum? 
And we could understand grace better by understanding that its opposite is debt. We understand debt, don't we? We know what it is to be in debt. But grace is more than being simply out of debt or being debt-free. Grace is much more than that because if my debt is canceled, that is a wonderful truth, isn't it? It's wonderful to be debt-free. But guess what? When I'm debt-free, I'm still broke. I don't have anything. But no, grace doesn't only cancel the debt, it cancels my impossible debt of sin, and grace lavishes me with the unspeakable wealth and riches of the righteousness of Christ. The opposite of debt is not no debt. The opposite of debt is wealth. And grace makes me wealthy with the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 11, verses 5 and 6 says that at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by God's grace. And if it is by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it's grace, it cannot be based on works. If it were based on works, grace would no longer be grace. Romans 11, verses 5 and 6. Any works-based system of religion, any works-based system of salvation cancels grace and results in damnation. And we need to be clear on this because we believe what makes Christianity, what makes the Bible distinct is that it teaches that salvation comes by grace alone. If you have worked for it, it's not grace. If you have earned it, it's not grace. If you deserve it, it's not grace. If you've tried to pay for your sins, they are not paid for. Even a million years in the lake of fire does not pay for any of your sin. Grace is the free gift of God that comes to those who deserve wrath. It comes to us through Jesus Christ. Grace takes those with an impossible debt of sin and makes them completely righteous, freely giving them the righteousness of Jesus Christ. This morning, this topic, as we look at the gracious God, the destiny of your eternal soul and my eternal soul rests on the grace of God that we'll be focusing on this morning. So we ought to pay attention to what God means by his grace. Let's pray before we look at our text in 2 Kings 5. Father, we thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit, and we ask that you would come and awaken our hearts, illumine our minds by your Spirit, and magnify Jesus Christ. Come by your Spirit, renewing our faith, changing our lives, with your words of life found here in the Bible. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says in Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. This morning, the next biographical sketch we want to look at is to do with God being the gracious God, and we're going to look here in 2 Kings chapter 5 as we look at this gracious God. I'm going to start by reading, first of all, verses 1 to 7 of 2 Kings 5. And the thing I want to look at first is that grace is remarkably surprising. Grace is remarkably surprising. First seven verses of 2 Kings 5. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram, or the, of Syria. He was a great man in the sight of his master. He was highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but 
he had leprosy. Now, bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him that the girl from Israel had, what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you can cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read this letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See, he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. First, in these first seven verses, we want to look at the grace of God is remarkably surprising. The grace of God is remarkably surprising. Now, in this passage, we're introduced first off to three characters, three key characters. First of all, there's Naaman, then there's this little girl, and then there's also the quirky prophet, Elisha. What you need to know about Naaman, verse 1, Naaman was a commander. He was a great man. He was highly regarded. He was a valiant soldier. Naaman was a great man. Naaman was a mighty man of valor. Now imagine valor. Imagine if this was your identity. This was a great man, a famous man, a somebody, a big shot. He was highly regarded, a great man. That's how we're introduced to him. He's commander of the army of Syria. It's one of the most powerful nations on the planet. And it's important to note this, that Naaman is a great man. He's a somebody. Others think highly of Naaman. They think Naaman is a great man. But Naaman thinks Naaman is a great man in our story. I'm great. I'm someone who commands respect. But Naaman has leprosy. Now, the leprosy at this time, the disease, had no cure, and there was a terrible stigma attached to the disease. Leprosy was a disease of isolation and quarantine. We talk about that a bit at the moment, don't we? Well, if you think we're talking about it now, leprosy was far worse. It was a life sentence to isolation, and there was this terrible stigma. So although Naaman is this great man, he's got a great problem leprosy. Then there's the little girl in verse 2. It says, bands of raiders came from Syria, and they'd gone out and taken captive a little girl of Israel, and this girl served the commander's wife, Naaman's wife. I want you to think for a minute, what would it be like to be this little girl? Maybe her family was dead, killed by the raiders. I don't know. Or very, at the very least, she was abducted and taken away from her family. Torn away from family, from country, from friends, from parents. In a military raid by Syria, which we can only assume that raid was commanded by who? Naaman. And this little girl, this little slave girl, in, is in a foreign land, and she is a slave girl of Naaman's wife. And then we have Elisha, this peculiar prophet. And if you want to read Elisha's story, read through 2 Kings. But what I want to point out is that faith is rem or sorry, grace is remarkably surprising because the grace of God is sent by God through this little abducted slave girl to, of all people, Naaman. That is a surprising path for grace to follow to Naaman, isn't it? 
grace is remarkably surprising. But in verses 8 to 12, I'd like to look at the next thing, is that grace is remarkably infuriating. Grace is remarkably infuriating. Let's read verses 8 to 12 of 2 Kings 5. Verse 8. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Make the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went to his, went with his horses and chariots, and he stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Picture it. Elisha sent a messenger out to him to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry, and he said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure my leprosy. Are not Abana and Parfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Can't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Grace is remarkably infuriating. Grace is remarkably infuriating. Grace is too easy. Grace is too simple. Grace is too narrow. The Jordan? Grace is too humiliating. Grace is too free. See, Naaman's arrival, if you look at the verses and all the things that he sent with to Israel, his arrival in Israel portrays two main attitudes. First of all, Naaman, I come as a great man. Chariots, horses, attendants. I come as one who's worthy to be helped and healed. We need to see that. I am worthy. The other attitude that we see in Naaman is this. I have what it takes to pay for this grace. I have what it takes to pay for this healing. But Naaman does not get what he was expecting. There are a couple of uh, particular products in Lidl that I like. And you've probably noticed there's no Lidl in Douglas. I'm waiting for one. I have to talk to Eloy and get that sorted. <coughs> but this week I was in Balancholig. And I knew there was a Lidl in Balancholig, so as I was driving through the village, I was keeping an eye out, and I saw a sign. I saw the sign. I saw the yellow. I saw the blue. I saw the red. I signaled left. I waited for two red lights. And then I pulled into the car park, parked my car. I checked to see that I had coins for the trolley. I put on my mask. I went and got my trolley. I sanitized my hands, I pushed my trolley through the automatic doors, and I started to head for where I know this product is in Lidl, because they're all kind of laid out the same, aren't they? And as I'm pushing my trolley towards this place, suddenly it comes into my head. Hey, wait a minute. And I wasn't in Lidl at all. I was in Aldi. So I just gave up. I went home disappointed. I didn't get what I'd hoped for. Still don't have it. For Naaman, he's experiencing a much more massively disappointing experience. He's come all the way from Syria with all this stuff. And this is nothing close to what he was anticipating. God's grace infuriates and God's grace humiliates and confuses Naaman. Now, what does Naaman come with? If you look in verses 5 and 6 and 9, he's got silver, he's got gold, 
He's got clothes, and he didn't get them in pennies, and they're gifts. He's got a letter from the king. He's got chariots and horses, a show of military display. He's got attendants. I am a somebody, and I'm ready to pay for this healing. Just look at the 6,000 shekels of gold. There's about 50 of us in here. Can you imagine this morning, as you came through the door, if I gave each of you a 1 kg bar of gold as you came in? There you go. That's for you. I'm not sure the price of gold this minute, but it's, that would be something like thirty-five to 40,000 euro each bar. There you go. There you go. There you go. Well, actually, there's 69 kgs of gold that he's hauling with him. That's 2.4 million euro in today's money in the value of gold. Imagine if I was to give you that. This whole scene portrays that Naaman is making a display of wealth, a display of power, a display of importance, a display of worthiness, a display of prominence. He is a brave and decorated and valiant warrior. And he is worthy of a healing. He is wealthy enough to buy the miracle. Naaman fully expected to pay and to pay heavily for any sort of healing. The way you get what you need is you pay for it. You get what you pay for. Just pay. You can have whatever you want if you've got the money. But grace does not come by us paying. Grace is a free gift. And the prophet sends out an attendant. And what is Naaman's reaction when this attendant comes out and says, wash in the Jordan in verse 11? Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out and stand before me and wave his hand over the place and call him the name of his God. He's furious. I am Naaman. I'm a somebody. I'm a big shot. I'm wealthy. And now I am indignant. I am angry. I'm feeling disrespected. Verse 11, he says, This prophet, he didn't even bother leaving the house. Who does he think he is? I expected him to come out to me. I expected him to wave his hand over me and call on his God. I expected a nice little magic show. I mean, look at all I'm ready to pay. Even better, a nice healing service with the organ playing away in the background. And he won't even come out. I refuse to be treated like this. I am Naaman. I am not being recognized for who I am. I'm not being recognized by this puny little quirky prophet who stays in his puny little house. I've got important letters from the king. I've come with chariots and horses, a display of power, might, and wealth. I'm ready to pay. And the prophet sends out an offer of grace for God, from God that is unearned undeserved, that cannot be paid for. And Naaman is furious. The grace of God is remarkably infuriating. This grace is too simple. It's too free. It's too humiliating. It's too insulting. I'm not having this. I'm out of here. We need to note that this gracious God in Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7, does not feel compelled to meet our expectations. This God is not impressed with your credentials and your achievements. This gracious God refuses to allow you to hold on to your ego and your pride. This gracious God refuses to endorse your own self-righteousness, your own sense of worthiness, and your own sense of you've earned his favor. This God does not need a thing from you. And he does not need a thing from me. The gracious God. God insists on providing 
all that we need freely. Grace. This is how grace works. And for many, many, many people, in fact, for many of us, before we came to know God's grace, we found the teaching of grace infuriating. It's offensive. It damages our pride and sense of accomplishment and worthiness, and people refuse it. They go home without it. They hate it. God's grace will first humiliate you before it delivers you. God's grace will humiliate you before it rescues you. Grace is remarkably infuriating, but also in verses 13 to 19, grace is remarkably transforming. Let's read what, Naaman, what happens with Naaman in verse 13. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and he dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept this gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. Hear it? I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. Emphatic. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord, the God of Israel. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimen to bow down, and he's leaning on my arm, and I have to bow down there also. When I bow down in the temple of Rimen, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, said Elisha. Grace is remarkably surprising. Grace is remarkably infuriating, but grace is remarkably transforming, as we see here in these verses. Verses 13 to 19. Thank God Naaman brought along his attendants. They appealed to him, why not humble yourself and go into the Jordan? And when he goes in, there is change. Yes, there is a miraculous healing of God. The Jordan didn't have special metaphysical qualities. God healed Naaman. Grace changes things, and grace changes people. Look at verse 14. He, he says he was, he humbled himself, he went and dipped in the Jordan seven times, and he was, the words, he was restored, he was made clean. What a picture for sinners who have a much worse disease than leprosy, the unshakable disease of sin. He was restored. He was cleansed. Look at Naaman. What a change. This big shot, this somebody, how has Naaman changed? Well, look in verses 17 to 18. You'll see there that four times he uses the term your servant to this prophet who had just infuriated him. Your servant, your servant, your servant, your servant. Something has changed. The grace of God has come into Naaman's life and things have changed. What is Naaman's request? Well, he's requested that there's two mule loads of soil 
to bring back. Now, we might say, Naaman, you're very immature. You don't need soil from Israel to sacrifice to the living God. But there's grace even for his immaturity, isn't there? What has Naaman learned? He's learned in verse 15, there is no God but the Lord, the God of Israel, and he alone will I worship. What is Naaman's of the request? Well, when I'm in the temple of Rimmon with my master, may the Lord forgive if I bow down. We might say, Naaman, we'd like to see you grow up a little more than this. Come on, take a stand. But he's told, go in peace. Grace is shown to this undeserving, proud man. This egotistical man has been humiliated and is now becoming a humble man. This idol-worshipping man is not wanting to worship, is now wanting to worship the only God of grace and no longer wanting to worship idols. In this story, Naaman got far more than a healing, didn't he? Naaman was converted. It's a remarkable story of grace. Naaman's life was turned upside down and grace came in Grace humiliated this proud man and wealthy man. And grace begun to change this man into a humble man who worships God alone and did not pay a thing for the grace he had received. What should we do about God's grace? In Luke chapter 4, verses 23 to 30, Jesus is in his hometown in Nazareth. He's in the synagogue, and the people are rejecting him there. They are rejecting the grace of God in his hometown. And Jesus points out that God's grace will be extended to Syrians, to Sidonians, to Nigerians, to Filipinos, to Irish, to Peruvians, to South Africans, to Scots, to Belgians, and on and on it will go, to Brazilians. And you know what the response in Jesus' hometown was when he said, he told the story of Naaman and the story of the widow of Sidon. Do you know what the response was when Jesus said that the grace of God is going to extend beyond Israel? They were infuriated. There it is again infuriated by the grace of God, and they tried to kill Jesus on the spot. The story of Naaman is used by Jesus to tell us that the grace of God was coming to all of us. Isn't that wonderful? But the response from us needs to be this. We must repent on any reliance on our own performance, our own personal righteousness, our own worthiness, our own attempts to pay for our sins, we must repent of them all and come to God and receive this free grace given to us in Jesus Christ. Because relying on any of this is a rejection of the grace of God. If you've earned it, it's not grace. If you deserve it, it's not grace. If you have worked for it, it's not grace. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. This is what we believe and this is what we read about in the scriptures. Jesus has done it all. Through his death on the cross, and God refuses to let us add anything to what Jesus has done. He has taken away our debt of sin and lavished us with the wealth of his righteousness so that before God we stand right because of Christ alone, through grace alone. Because God saves us by grace alone, no more relying on your own goodness. No more relying on your own righteousness won't do. No more relying on your own performance or worthiness. Can I appeal to you as we look at this? This grace of God is not a small thing. 
This grace of God that is given to us through Jesus is our everything. It is our eternity. And I would appeal to you to consider the state of your eternal soul this morning very carefully. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Have you been humiliated by the grace of God? If you haven't, I don't think you've understood the grace of God at all. Consider the state of your eternal soul this morning. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Are you attempting to earn your salvation? Are you relying on your own virtue, your own worthiness? Or are you relying on Christ alone? We are not safe from God's wrath unless Jesus makes us safe by his grace. Romans 5 verse 15 says this, The free gift, free gift, came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, and abounded to many. Here's some of us anyway. This grace abounds to many. I'd like us to sing Rock of Ages, Clef for Me, as we respond to this um, passage and this teaching we've read about the gracious God. And as we sing Rock of Ages, I'd like us to really think about the verse that says this, Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked I come to thee for dress. Helpless I look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Let's sing this together and rejoice in the grace of God that is in our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for this grace. Help us not to rely on anything in ourselves, but to receive this free grace freely through you. Help us to understand and be transformed by your grace. Amen. We'll sing now. If we may all rise to sing this closing song. Close in death when I soar to worlds unknown.